Good day, Mr. Briggs. Please select an agent for your next mission. Scanning Imperial Agent Database. Qualified Agent Found. Agent ID, Christopher Griffin. Agent Cover Story, Freelance Writer, Mongoose Publishing. Details as follows. Greetings, travelers, and welcome to Traveler Mayday Mayday 2022. Sponsored by Cyborg Prime Games. You can find me at cyborgprime.com or by searching for my name in the Facebook search tool, or find a link in the video description below. Thank you for joining us for the fourth annual May Day May Day Traveler Day event. It's a day we celebrate Traveler and all its additions and offshoots for all the fun times it's given us around the gaming table with friends and family. I'm your host, Frank Sicardi, also known as Cyborg Prime, and today I'm happy to introduce our guest, Christopher Griffin of Mongoose Publishing. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me back, Frank. Hey, this is your uh, second time you sat with us for an interview, so thank you for your continued support. Yes, you're quite welcome, and thank you. Hopefully you'll uh, return next year to uh, chat with us again. That'll be our fifth year. Oh, awesome. Cool. Yeah, I, of course I would love to. I'm already... I, book me. Fantastic. <laughs> I'll pencil you in. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Chris, why don't you introduce yourself? Who are you and what do you do? All right. Uh, my name is Christopher Griffin. I am a freelance writer for uh, Mongoose Publishing. And uh, more recently, I have become a graphic novel writer for uh, uh, Marcosia Comics out of Britain, which has an arrangement with, uh, with Mongoose. And we'll, we can talk more about that as we get into to what I've been up to. Oh, that sounds super interesting. Yeah. All right. So uh, tell us. So... Where are you from? Where do you live now? And where did you grow up? Yeah, so I was uh, born in uh, Lansing, Michigan, when uh, my dad was uh, finishing his undergrad at Michigan State and really had no business having kids uh, with no money what, uh, whatsoever. And my parents quickly picked up sticks and moved to California when I was two months old. And I grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, went to college down at UC Santa Barbara, but uh, shot right back up like a boomerang to the Bay Area and uh, started working in the tech industry where I became a technical writer. And more recently, I'm a, a manager of technical writers. So I, instead of doing all the writing, I now corral others and make them do all the hard work. So do you have any uh, hobbies aside from gaming? Uh, yeah, quite a few, actually. Uh, I, I like to stay in shape, so I do a lot of mountain biking and more recently swimming. We added a swimming, swimming pool to the backyard recently and uh, try, and, try and stay fit. Uh, my wife and I have four kids and they're spread throughout the globe, so we do quite a bit of traveling to go visit them. Got uh, right now a daughter in Hawaii, one in Los Angeles, one in, a son in New York, and another son in Paris. So so we try and do a lot of traveling, and uh, luckily they're in places that are nice to visit for the most part. So that's what I was going to say. You're fortunate that they're all in uh, nice vacationing places. Yes, yeah. No one's uh, hanging out in the Antarctic or anything like that. <laughs> right. I asked uh, some friends when I was visiting Hawaii, uh, where do Hawaiians go for vacation? <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, uh, big Vegas. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's what they that's said. the answer. Okay, I didn't expect such a clear answer, but yeah, yeah, um, me neither. I, I, I can surprised. imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you're a uh, a fan of sci-fi. Uh, what uh, yeah. do you have a favorite um, sci-fi book or TV show or something that has inspired you in the ways of sci-fi? Well, many, but uh, I my absolute favorite series is uh, Ian Banks. I'm sorry, he goes by Ian M. Banks uh, for his sci-fi writing. Uh, Ian M. Banks Culture Series. If you haven't read it, do yourself a favor and check them out. There's 10 books in the series, and it's, it's not a sequential series. Each one can be read individually, but uh, most of them are really good stuff. But uh, I, I read a lot of sci-fi, and uh, some of it can directly pertain to Traveler and some not. Nah, I've recently gotten into reading uh, Octavia E. Butler. If you're, familiar, if you're not familiar with Octavia Butler, I highly recommend her work. It's very, uh, very different. It is what you, some call Afrocentric science fiction, which is the, one of the great things about sci-fi these days is that, is that there are a lot of new voices, uh, mm -hmm. and it's not all... Uh, white males, uh, like myself. Uh, there's a lot of new pe new voices contributing to sci-fi, which I think is great. I mean, uh, I, you know, I've always loved 
science fiction in all its forms. So um, the more, the merrier. I wonder if there was a nod to Octavia in the recent uh, Lovecraft Country uh, TV show. Was did what, did you hear something? Was there there something was a character there? called Octavia, <laughs> and of course you know all the main characters are uh, African American folks, and um, yes. they uh, she travels to another uh, dimension and then is like go, transported to wherever she wants to go through time. Yeah, I bet name. it was. Man, uh, I I'll could bet. be mistaken. I'm just going by memory. Yeah, no, it the you know if if you detect. The, the possible influence there, it's probably 75% at least, it probably was a tribute to her. Because, hmm. I mean, she was pretty prolific. She, uh, great writer, a lot of good material. I wouldn't exactly say it's directly inspirational to Traveler, the thing she wrote, but right. uh, it's great stuff nonetheless. The the Traveler stuff, for me, is all the space opera. Uh, another good author is uh, Adrian Tchaikovsky, a, another great recent, uh, more recent, author of sci-fi he's written a couple good books um his, his newest one's called shards of earth i believe and he's got some ones previous to that as well uh that that i really recommend he writes a lot of fantasy too but he's been doing some space opera so he's another good one uh what is it about the space opera genre that's kind of hooks you or but that appeals to you so much well, I blame Star Wars. I mean, I, I was like nine years old when the first Star Wars movie came out. And like, you know, like 10 million other kids, it blew my mind. And I mean, I, I didn't realize that the production values could be so great, something that a sci-fi uh, film could be so immersive until I saw that movie. Of course, now, you know, uh, like 45 years later and... Uh, it, there's far more advanced uh, special effects and that sort of thing. But for the time, it was amazing. And, and I've always been a big Star Wars fan. So it's because of that. I, I blame them for my interest in space opera. Probably the Star Trek, the original series, too, which I was also into as a kid. If you could uh, see another, if you could see uh, any sci-fi movie over for the first time, what would it be? If I could see another one over? Yeah, it's like if you could see... Uh... Uh, uh, any sci-fi movie that you've already seen, if you could see it again for the first time. Oh, uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Probably Aliens. Aliens. I mean, uh -huh. I love that movie. It's just it, who who doesn't, right? It's it's right. just it's just so great. Yeah. It, it, so there was so much suspense. My hands were sweating. I was, you know, terrified. And you, you get introduced to all these characters, and you just know they're all doomed. And uh, just kind of going through that story for the first time would be a lot of fun. I think James Cameron did an awesome job on that movie. Yeah, that's a good point. They, they all start out very cocky. And you know that what's in store for them. And they don't know what's in store for them. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would definitely be uh, my first pick to, to, to see for the very first time yet again. That's a good one. All right. So uh, how did you get uh, into uh, role-playing games? Do you remember your first uh, experiences with uh, getting into gaming? Yeah, a friend in, in middle school introduced me to Dungeons & Dragons. Like, you know, obviously it's the, it was the number one, right? The Sort of the, the very first role-playing game to really catch fire. And uh, I, I thought fantasy was a cool thing, too, swords and sorcery and that sort of thing. I'd started to dabble into Conan and, and read a little bit of... Uh, uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, full disclosure, I did not get through it in middle school like so many of my friends. I, I, I didn't read it till decades later and enjoyed it very much. But I always had more of a love for sci-fi and space opera than fantasy. And then I just, you know, after playing Dungeons and Dragons for a summer, I, I was thinking, boy, it sure would be great if there were a science fiction version of, of this thing. And went down to the local hobby shop and saw you know, lo and behold, the the little black books in there, cool little folio size. Is that the right size? Is that, is that folio, the seven by eight or whatever the, the heck the, you mentioned? The eight and a half by 11 turned sideways or whatever? Actually, I don't even think it was that big. The the little, the first box set of Traveler with, that had books one through three, that was there. And it was just so elegant and just, you know, just no, no pictures on the cover, just this beautiful black, white, and red. And science fiction, you know, they had me at uh, 
this free day free trader beowulf mayday mayday and <laughs> i picked it up and i saw some of the supplements because i this must have been around 1979 or 80 um and i snapped up any of the supplements that were available then and brought it home and so that uh I quickly realized it wasn't ideal for reproducing Star Wars, which was the first thing we tried to do with it. Uh, it was it was different, right? It, uh, Mark Miller and Lauren Wiseman and his and Frank Chadwick and the crew really were inspired by the sci-fi of the '40s through the '70s, and uh, it it piqued my interest in in a broader range of science fiction uh, inspiration. And uh, but but we quickly adapted to what the game offered us and started creating our own stories with it. What is it early on. What is it uh, about Traveler that kind of hooked you? With? Just that it was sci-fi or was it um was there a particular thing like the character creation, sector creation of the planets or spaceships mm-hmm. or all of it together? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was obviously very different, right? We, we did dabble in a few other games. So Traveler didn't completely hook us the first time around. Uh, I mean, we, I tried Star Frontiers as a kid. Uh, we, we did Gamma World. But Traveler always kept calling us back. And I think if I were to credit one book that really did it, it would be Supplement 7, Traders and Gumboats. Seeing those cool deck plans for all the main adventure class ships, you're like, oh, okay. Like, I could picture my my character living on this thing and flying around. So I, while we our, our loyalty was a little divided at first, still playing D&D and trying these other games and coming back to Traveler, I, I think that supplement and maybe uh, a few of the other ones really made Traveler the main game for us. For me, it was the... Uh... Uh, generating star uh, subsectors. I could just oh, you, do that yeah. all day long, pages and pages. pages, oh, and pages. I would, plus making characters, right? Characters, making characters yeah. was fun because they would die all the time. And, you know, I was like 11 years old, so we'd cheat. You know, you'd roll a three for survival and go, oh, did anyone see that? Okay, you know, this guy's been through four terms already. I am not letting this guy die. But uh, eventually you learn that that's part of the process. You, you feel you do, it, you do it fairly. You don't cheat. And if your guy survives to become a character, he's, he's uh, very much worth having. So what solidified your gaming life into, into Traveler? Well, um, you know, it's, it's the one we always would come back to. I, I kind of fell out of gaming for a while when I went to college and, and then came back and started a family. And, but my, uh, my group of friends... Uh, liked my refereeing. And so we, they would always talk, hey, let's do another game. So I think in the mid 90s, Mega Traveler was around. So we, we went back to Traveler and we ran uh, a, a game. And actually, no, it was Mega Traveler, then it was TE, right? And so we, we kind of bridged that gap for a little bit. After TE stopped publishing, we dropped out again. And uh, I, just, I kept paying attention to T4, it didn't really appeal to me, uh, T20, the various other versions. And then just pretty much. Uh, or we start. We played another game. I don't know if you're familiar with Deadlands. Uh, uh, the like cowboy a, game. It's like Boot Hill. Yeah, it, well, it, Boot Hill meets a horror movie. I guess would be a okay. way to describe it. That was a super fun game. Uh, it, it was just there's a lot of laughs in it. You're using playing cards and poker chips and things like that. So we went to that for a bit, but then we really just dropped out of gaming for a while. But I had all these games up on the shelf, and then my sons got old enough. I, I have two sons, Nick and Anthony, and they got old enough where they they remember si- sitting here, me sitting around with my friends at the table, rolling dice and playing these games and having a good time. And they said, "Hey, play one of those games that you played." And uh, so I thought, "Well, how about Traveler?" I seem to remember someone's publishing it, and I it was like 2007, 2008, or something like that. And I and I saw I fell in or fell upon the Mongoose uh, version, you know, version one uh, books and bought several of them. And I ran a couple games with them and it was hilarious. <laughs> it was, uh, introducing them to the game. Uh, what, what I found so funny was my, uh, my older son was shooting everything in sight. And my younger son who had a, never fired a bullet from his, in, from his weapon. They, I had them on some story that was uh, where they, discover that people are being held against their will like slaves working a mine somewhere on an asteroid and they go in there and rescue people and be the heroes and the younger my younger son tried to solve things with you know his brains my older one with blowing everything to bits and uh so pretty amusing stuff that's hilarious 
yeah. That, that, so that's it, such so a that got me back styles. into it. Yeah, yeah. So that got me back into it, and then my, the old group of friends eventually recontacted me and said, "Hey, what, you know, when are we going to do this?" So we we few years passed where what we weren't playing again, and then discovered that Mongus has done version two, and that that must have been like 2016, and I've been back in it ever since. Uh, Fantastic. And, and yeah, we've been having a real good time with it, and I've and it's helped me. Uh, make all kinds of new friends all over the country. You know, uh, the pandemic was, of course, horrible and, you know, it, it very unfortunate event. But it for gaming, it was kind of interesting because you, you want to keep gaming? Well, you've got online resources with which to do it. And we ended up expanding and we, we've got guys in uh, Pennsylvania. I've got a friend in Wisconsin, another one in Colorado. So, you know, it, we were able to keep going despite the fact that we weren't in the same uh, same location. I love how uh, uh, online gaming has become more mainstream. Uh, in that, you know, there's not just not just tabletop, but <clears throat> you know, just in like uh, you know, uh, online with your Xbox or with on Steam or whatever. It seems like now now the world is your player pool and meeting friends, met friends from all over the world playing Mech Warrior and. Uh, and here it is eight years later and these folks are like super nice super good friends yeah that we're we'll we'll always be uh, gaming buddies and, and friends you know outside of yeah no it's it's really cool isn't it i mean yeah. we, I've, I've played with a guy as far away as finland uh so it's it's really it, it really is worldwide now so very fun yeah super fun i've got uh two players up in canada a guy in australia uh, a couple players in england and a player in germany very nice. Yeah, super great. Do you have a uh, favorite traveler career that you like to play? Favorite career um, that I like to play? Uh, I probably answered something different last year, but this year I'm going to answer Hunter. Hunter. And I wrote the, the Hunter, uh, a Hunter career that's going to appear in the new JTAS, uh, Journal of the Traveler's Aid Society series. It's in uh, volume seven or eight, I think. Anyway, I tried to replicate the feel of the original Hunter class from, uh, from Classic Traveler, and, but make it more mongoose-esque. And I provided three career paths that involve kind of being an outdoors person. And I know that there is mongoose with mongoose there is an attempt to kind of let's let's rein in the number of careers but my feeling was come on hunter is a classic we right. we have we have to bring it back right so uh, uh i tried to introduce it in a uh, one of the core adventures i wrote core adventure one invasive species but uh matt would he said well let's hold off and put that in a companion or in the journal and i said all right well that's fine as long as it appears and uh, so i would i i really like playing that kind of character and it's probably because i'm completely incompetent in the outdoors so you can play something that you're not you know this kind of rugged uh outdoorsman great shot knows how to hand would suck poison out of the wound if necessary uh you know it, he, he can do all kinds of things in in not just an Earth-like survival environment, but on other worlds as well. And what uh, what would he primarily spend his time as a tour guide, as a uh, taking people probably, on, on uh, you know <clears throat> excursions, safaris? Yeah, I think yeah, probably safaris would be good. I, I'm not big on killing things, so uh, I I can role play it, but. Uh -huh. uh, it, I kind of like the idea of a safari guide, and then you get into misadventures. And I love the safari ship; it's it's my it's my favorite of the adventure class ships. It, I think that would be a really cool campaign. H hence, why I wrote an adventure about it. Actually, uh, that that gets people gets the characters into one. Um. So we'll look out for the hunter career. All right. So this year's um, theme is agents. Do you have a sci-fi agent that you like? Sci-fi agent. Um. Probably. Uh, Bora Horza Gobotul from uh, Consider Phlebas, which is the first of Ian Banks' culture series. This guy is a, uh, it's not a spoiler to say that he's a shapeshifter because it's revealed in, I think, the first chapter of the book. And he's kind of a, an insurgent. And I think you could call him an agent. He's definitely working against, uh, the, I don't want to blow any more than that. He's, he's working against a very powerful agency, a, a, a very powerful enemy, and trying to disrupt them by capturing something that's very important to them. And uh, he goes through all kinds of horrific misadventures that I could totally imagine in a traveler campaign. 
Okay. Tell me, how did you get involved uh, with Mongoose Publishing? Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, my little history of getting into their games, and uh, I started playing uh, when I got the group, got, got the band back together, and we started playing uh, uh, Mongoose 2E. Uh, we, we did uh, several adventures, and I, and I started writing a few of my own, and I kind of felt that, you know, I, it would be cool if I could publish these things. Uh, as a technical writer, I've I've got a bit of a talent for um, organizing information, for writing, <laughs> and for uh, uh, graphically laying things out. So I was really excited to learn that Mongoose had what's called the TAS program, Traveler's Aid Society, which allows you to create your own supplements and adventures and whatever you want, as long as you put their logo on it, and then you, you, you uh, publish it on drive through and uh, you get some, you get money for it too, which is great. And you just price it yourself. So I priced my, I wrote several adventures and then uh, priced them pretty low because I just wanted to kind of get my name out there. And I, I got pretty much the catalyst that made me really want to get these things on drive through it wasn't the money, but it's that I once saw Mongoose would publish this, uh, an annual state of the Mongoose announcement. Uh -huh. And they sit, they announced that, uh, they were going to have a supplement called the Glorious Empire, and I don't know if if Matt had someone else on tap. Probably Martin, I guess. It, Martin was the only writer for a while. Um, Martin Doherty, and to to write that at some point. But it, uh, I thought, darn it, man, I would I would love to write that book. And so when I started publishing, really my my uh, goal was to if they didn't get that thing written, uh, I wanted to be the writer of it. So. After I got my third adventure published, it was pretty successful. It's called Maker God, and it's it's like a gold seller on drive through So it's done very well. All right, congrats I, on I that. Went, yes, thank you. Uh, it's been out for several years, uh, but it's. Uh, I, I went to Matt and said, hey, it's, it's done really well. I think maybe you would hire me for some of your official products. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, oh, maybe. <laughs> and uh, here, write, write a couple adventures first, and let's see what, what you got. So let's see what you got, kid. And uh, I, I wrote one called Exodus. And then he wanted me to write a couple of naval adventures. So I wrote Naval Adventure 3, Fire on the Sandali and Maine, and Naval Adventure 4. Um, and then I uh, I said, okay. I felt like, uh, you know, now can I write Glorious Empire? And he said, yeah, go ahead. And uh, so I started writing that. And that was uh, a challenge. It was a big book. And it took me a long time. <laughs> it took me almost a year, I think. Uh, and so I kind of disappeared and uh, into my little hovel riding away on this thing. But I did eventually get it done and real pleased with how it came out. What appealed to me about it was it is such a, if you've, if you've played, if you use the official products for adventures, and maybe you've done Pirates of Drenax or any of the other Trojan Reach based adventures, you may know about the Glorious Empire. It's this little sliver of uh, uh, Ocelon space that's occupied by a, a, a branch of the Ocelon who are not part of the Hyrule. They practice slavery and they capture mostly human slaves from other worlds. And uh, are, are, it's one of the main basis of their uh, society is having slaves. And it just sounds like a terrible, horrific place. And it's falling apart too. You, you know that this thing is, it's collapsing under its own weight. So I did some research on it, and I took a look at what its eventual fate is in by looking at uh, Mega Traveler. Okay. Those of you, you're you're familiar with Mega Traveler, Frank, I'm sure, yes. uh, where it goes far into the future, and um, uh, eventually, eventually, uh, virus comes and destroys everything. Uh, but which before that, you have uh, once the the emperor is assassinated, and uh, all the various parties go to war with each other, the Haslan become opportunists and come pouring across the border into Trojan Reach and the Spimber Marches. And um, the, in the process, they devastate uh, the Glorious Empire. But, you know, as we've learned, not everyone likes the idea of the Third Imperium setting getting uh, crushed and, and uh, virus coming about and wrecking everything. Uh, I think it was Lauren who created the Lauren verse, right, where that doesn't happen. We and just dealt I, with it by having the uh, the virus infected our ship, and we had to retrieve to the cryopods. And when we woke up, we were in the new era. Ah, nice. Yeah, that's the way a lot of people did it. Um, we we did a different thing. I just started a Regency campaign, which is sort of the another cop out way of doing the new era, um, because the Regency is more or less things like they used to be, uh, except that there's 
a quarantine zone where you can hide from virus. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I saw their eventual fate and thought, let's, let's write about what's going on in the era that Mongoose is covering, 1105. And so I uh, got that done and, and it was pretty well received and, uh, and got me more work with them. And the main, got to write several more adventures. And then the next big project that Matt had me write was uh, Third Imperium. So that's a ginormous uh, accomplishment. I was looking through it earlier, and uh, it's pretty thorough. I mean, uh, oh, thank you. There, it's uh, well over two hundred, about two hundred forty pages ish. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, and uh, has lots of illustrations and mm -hmm. starships, grav tanks, reentry vehicles, um, all kinds of mm -hmm. cool things. Um, I remember some of those things are. Like this reentry vehicles from off a mag, uh, far and away or something, or one of those magazines uh, that was probably oh, yeah, 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 very cool. I uh, saw so they carried some of that over. So, so tell me about uh, where do you, how did you come up with all of this content? Is there enough like in the canon that you could put this together? And I mean, like, how much more did you add? To it? Uh, quite a bit, but it was, it was that book or was a lot of research. Um, it, I kind of. I, I dug up every bit of canon that I could find and then some stuff that was questionably canon or not canon okay. and considered it, uh, it and, you know, potentially would deign something. This is now canon, you know, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> this sounds but good. I, canon. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, someone wrote it and it wasn't, it was in a travel and like it was in challenge magazine. It's fair game. Right. Or right. something like that. Okay. Okay. Um, in, in, in a few cases, maybe something from some fanzines as well, but mostly the, the two primary resources for that book were supplements, or sorry, the three primary resources for that book were uh, Class of Traveler supplements, uh, 8 and 11, library data, that's the two library data ones, right. and the Imperial Encyclopedia from Mega Traveler. Th those have are loaded with canon, but you find that once you start trying to do something big like that in Traveler, you know, it's got this really, one of the things a lot of people love about the game is uh, this detailed uh, set of lore. Not everyone does, probably fully half the people that play Traveler create their own universe, but, you know, it, a lot of people love the lore, and I'm one of them. So, uh, so I, I I dug up all the lore I could and 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 assembled that book based on what I discovered, and then I had contact with, uh, as as Matt calls them, the inner circle, including uh, Mr. Mark Miller himself, who oh. who got to review that book before it came out, and I thought, oh boy, he's not going to like this, that, and the other thing, and he was super accepting of it, <laughs> and he barely <laughs> had me change a thing. Um, so that, so that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 I try to do what, you know, what's called what they call fan service a lot in, in that book, which is put a lot of things in that people are going to like, like, uh, you know, the trepidograph tank is, is, is listed as a brand new vehicle somewhere around 1107, 1108. So I figured there are prototypes of it in play in 1105. So let's bring that in. I brought in the, the agent from, uh, uh Miller's agent of the Imperium, uh, mm -hmm. the concept of that, and some other things. Um, I, I took a I heavily researched or uh, Traveler's Digest from the Mega Traveler era by uh, Digest Group Publications, uh -huh. which is, had pretty much the entirety of resource material on Core Sector at the time. Because as you know, one of the things included in Third Imperium is a complete Core Sector that you can adventure in. And my take, like so many others, is uh, core sector. Why would I want to adventure there? Every it's you know been there forever. It's probably boring. It's all safe, and uh, and and the the nobles are all over the place in charge of everything. I'm sure it's a completely safe place. Um, it, I would you know let's stay this Finward marches the frontier, but actually, uh, as you get deeper in the research, you find that the construct of the Third Imperium is that individual worlds have a lot of freedom uh, self-determination so you're still going to have that you're not going to have any uniformity at all uh in in core sector uh you, you have a few worlds of much higher tech and quite a bit more population than there is on the frontier but i just kind of took that as an opportunity to present a setting that is different and yet also should be interesting and i really hope it Get, get some people to to join in. I think you can do adventures like if you're in, if your inspiration is Dune or uh, Foundation or or any of the other 
sort of grandiose empires that have appeared in science fiction. The Third Imperium book and core sector provides you a kind of a more apt setting for you to run that type of story. It's really a uh, great, great source book and detail of the nobility, the, the royal house, or like the royal household, the, uh, or the imperial household. Mm -hmm. You've know, got the, the history laid out. And then, like you said, you've got all this, um, all these detailed uh, systems from core. Uh, and it's really a great jumping off point for it's been, it's thorough and it, you know, it's got, uh, like you said, the grav tanks and ships and boy, lots right. of artwork to uh, inspire your imagination. Yeah. And I requested so. even more poor, poor Matt and his, and his art team. I mean, I, I had so many, I, they, they, when you're writing books for them, you get to say, here's an art suggestion. And I like loaded that thing with art suggestions, but, and thankfully he provided most of them, but but I, I always, uh, or I typically load my uh, manuscripts with lots of art requests. Yeah, it, uh, it, the, I've been really impressed with the artwork lately because uh, it seems like, well, he must have a team because he's doing it really quickly. Yeah, he's got a lot of good people. If you look in the credits of the various Mongoose books, you'll see the artists' names, and you can't, you don't always know which pieces that they're doing. I've gotten to know um, uh, one of the artists in particular. Uh, because I'm working on the uh, graphic novel with him. And he, he's one of their artists, his name is Javier Bernard. Uh, and he's in uh, France and um, uh, Javier's art's really cool. And what I liked about Matt selecting him for the graphic novel project is that when you look at Javier's art, he often tells a story in one picture. You'll see facial expressions, uh, action, um, lighting. He, he's got it, you know. Uh, he he really understands if he if a guy can tell a story in one picture then he can definitely tell a sequential art story so yeah he's been good to work with on the project another cool thing is like a bunch of new equipment in there like personal shields and and also i like all the details yes. of the subsectors that make up the core sector. yeah the personal shield that's controversial is uh, it? some people were not very happy with that one <laughs> i got some some of the the critics uh, kind of said well what's this you know you're, you're going to completely upend uh canon well one thing people need to realize is uh, I put that on the world Sabsi, which in Digest Group's uh, version of it, in their tra in the Traveler's Digest, there's a description that Sabsi is a place where experimental weapons are developed. Mm -hmm. So um, I want there's to present. A a yes, exactly. It's an experimental weapon. That doesn't mean every you know Tom, Dick, and Harry now has a personal shield. It means it, it is available at tech level 15, I think, or yep. 15, yeah, 15, 16, yeah. It doesn't mean that they're now manufactured at every single world. Right. There's uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, having something that's, you know, an extra tech level above what you're used to or, so, or a couple of tech levels. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the rules kind of support that, right? Even mm -hmm. in the uh, in, in high guard, you've got these rules that say you can create the next tech level up, but it's super expensive. Right. So, and I guess you're limited to like one one prototype subsystem on a ship that's an extra tech level up. I'd forgotten whether that's the case, which is probably not good because I just was involved in rewriting High Guard. But yes, I'm no. sure that's I'm sure that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah, uh how long did it take to put uh Third Imperium together? Now yeah that's what's interesting, right? It's uh it's nearly twice the size of Glorious Empire and it took me less than half the time. Uh, it I got it written in five months. Uh, so, what do you attribute uh, that to? Uh, more focus <laughs> and <laughs> less fear, uh, more confidence. You know, glorious writing the book, the glorious empire gave me confidence that I could write a book that big, and uh, and then just kind of, uh, you know, I have a day job as well as as mentioned. So I would get up super early in the morning and work on uh, on Third Imperium for three hours, and then do my regular job, and. Thankfully, my wife tolerated my exhaustion by 9 p.m. every night <laughs> and, uh, and so that I could complete the project. And I finished it on, I think it was like, uh, if not New Year's Eve, the day before that, uh, yeah, right before, God, it must have been 2019. Oh, I, it, it slips my mind, but it was, uh, it was, or maybe it was 2020. So it was in pandemic, which also helps. Yeah, mm, yeah that's right. right. It, that's right. It was 2020. Uh, so, yeah, there is... Um, the fact that we were all locked away in our homes during that time made it a little easier to, to complete a project of that size as well. So uh, uh, would it took another year or something to uh, get the layout and 
everything going or uh, it, yeah that book took some time i mean thankfully matt had a lot of people really closely go over it and people i i, I try to really self-edit my work as best i can and you know you, you in any game there are going to be typos it's yep. it's even even the hallowed uh uh, Wizards of the Coast in their D and D books have typos, but yeah. uh, and and fans do not like them. They no. complain about them incessantly, and I understand. It it doesn't. As a technical writer, if there's a typo in in something I write for my company, it's embarrassing, right? It makes yep. you look unprofessional. Yep. So it means a lot to me. But hey, I'm human. I leave typos in as well. And thankfully, Matt really went over that book with a fine tooth comb, um, and caught. A few things here and there. A, a few got through because there's so much lore and continuity. Uh, one of them that's extremely embarrassing for me is that I somehow had it in my head that the Sword Worlds was uh, colonized by sublight ships. Not the case at all. And I wrote that, and it was left in the book. Whoops. Whoops. Um, but but for the most part, we we try. We really do make a strong attempt to uh, ferret out errors like that and and get them out. And his crew. It, he had uh, one of the guys who helped design High, High Guard go through all my ship designs in that book and had questions on a few. We fixed them up. So, yeah, we went over it with a fine tooth comb to try and make it the best book we could. Fantastic. It's good to have a support team like that. Yeah, they're great. Uh, Matt's hired a great graphics team. Um, there, he's he's added several new employees over the last year or two while I've been there. And I, I know them via email, and they're all super pleasant to work with. And they 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 work they they try super hard to get the best uh, best products out as, that they can. That's got a super cool uh, work culture going on over there. He does. I mean, it's it's very progressive. Very uh, looks like very fun. Uh, apparently, they have a fake owl on their roof that's supposed to get pigeons away, and it's it, the drama is played out on Facebook, uh, which I like to see once in a while. <laughs> he seems like a really cool boss. Yeah. He seems, yeah. uh, and when I chat with him, he's very, very, very. Uh, yeah, he, he, he's been he's been great to work with. I was teasing I, him I about no the complaint. owl and pigeons. He's a good sport yeah. about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're losing that battle. Yeah, I was like, you should have put, uh, you know, that, that turret looks like a double laser anti pigeon laser turret to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that might that might have helped. Yes. <laughs> Be kind to pigeons. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, uh, um. Let's talk about uh, some other things. We're coming up sure. on the end of the our time allotment, but uh, okay. we still have a little bit of more time to talk about stuff. What else have you uh, been doing for uh, Mongoose? Uh, I heard there's a Traveler Explorers edition. We'll get started. Yeah, yes. So the Travelers Explor Explorer edition, and uh, we revamped High Guard. We should probably talk about those oh, yeah, two let's, things. Let's talk about those. Let's talk yeah. about Explorer's Edition briefly, and then let's get into High Guard. Yeah. If people want to. So Explorer's hear. Edition, uh, yeah, Matt wanted a a concise book to introduce people to Traveler and put it up there for ninety nine cents on uh, drive through. Uh -huh. And so he said, "Can you please boil down the core rule book to sixty four pages?" And I thought, "Okay, yeah. How how hard could it be?" Well, it is it is hard. <laughs> Actually, it was it was very difficult, and I I did some re quite a bit of rewriting, and and tried to throw away everything that wasn't needed for a person to it, to introduce themselves to traveler. And some of it's you know painful. You know, you're thinking, well, I like this though. I don't want to throw it out. But really, do they need this to do a to get a started? Bare, yeah, to get started and run a scout or or scholar character, right? It's sort of sort of your uh, exploratory campaign, and let's just give them Matt's. It's it's really it's all Matt's idea to to have the scout ship and an air raft kind of be the present ship and vehicle, and give give them all the tools to do some world building, build a couple characters of only these two careers, and set them free in in uh, to explore the universe. Oh, it comes so, with uh, it comes with world building as well. Yes, yeah, that's wow. all present, and uh, it it's. Uh, you know, you, you want them to have those tools that are that teach people that the game is fun. And world building, as you pointed out early in this discussion, uh, is one of the things you love to do. Getting out that little hex sheet and putting down planets and figuring out, you know, what's going on there, what kind of starport is there, how many people are there, etc. So that that's present in the in the Ex Explorers edition as well. Uh, I always like to bring more. You 
you know, we need to bring more people into the, uh, to the traveler uh, hobby in order to keep it yeah. going, you know? So any, anything that brings new players in is a uh, great addition as far as I'm fantastic. Agreed. Yes. Yeah. I, I want more people to know that this game is, is, is the best science fiction role-playing game there is. So uh, the more the merrier. Yeah. Great. All right. So let's talk about um, Highgard. Yeah, so uh, initially Matt asked me to write uh, crew descriptions. Uh, so, you know, the, there are crew roles on starships, right? And there's several that you allot. You, you, uh, there, there are rules for how many pilots, how many, you know, astrogators, engineers, et cetera, on a ship. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And then as it, it, for, for the new high guard, he said. And then eventually he came back to me and said, how about you just write the whole book? And um, my initial response was abject terror, uh, because I, I know that this is a sensitive book for fans of the game. They, people have a lot of opinions on things, and, and I thought, man, I'm going to get subjected. I'm, I'm going to have my feet over the fire on this one. It's all well and good when you're playing around with lore and writing uh, books like Glorious Empire and, and Third Imperium, but now you got to write the rules. So it was... Uh, it, I, I was frightened of the pos of working on it, but I, I uh, put on my big boy pants and, and got to work on it. And I recruited a crew of people to help me because in, in my opinion, uh, you can't really write a book like that without multiple perspectives. So I got a, a group of friends and people who I trust to, and, and other content writers for Mongoose to, to be involved. In, in the process and review what I wrote, uh, suggest changes. And, and frankly, some of the best suggestions uh, are, are not my invention. Um, one problem we had that, that Matt wanted us to solve was that big ships do not have appropriate armor. You, you've got these you know, alleged capital ships and they have armor four or something, or armor zero. And that doesn't, they can't survive in a conflict with a well-coordinated group of fighters could could blow away a capital ship. So why would anyone invest in big ships, of the, you know, if they can't survive even a couple of fighter squadrons? So we changed the rules so that the big ships can be loaded with armor, uh, provided they uh, are selected uh, the military hull classification. You'll see more if you, uh, if you buy the new edition when it comes out. But it also makes it more difficult for sub uh, ships below the adventure class level to pack on armor, um, which I think is fine because honestly, the, there's like fighters that have five tons of cargo space, you know, they don't need that. So now you're, you're forced to make some decisions and, and you, you're limited to how much armor you can pack on smaller ships. Didn't touch the adventure class ships. They're the same uh, note uh, the, because it, there's just too many of them out there and I don't want to uh, wreck all kinds of or, of continuity out there or sure. all kinds of existing designs. Did you kind of um, use those as kind of a baseline or? Uh, I just, uh, initially there was a proposal to affect them as well. And I said, I, and see, I'll say this, while I will be the guy listed as the author for this book, I was really more of a, uh, yes, I am the author and a heavy editor, but I'm also, I was like the, to put it in tech company terms, I was the product manager. Okay. Um, the facilitator. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, my, the guys I was working with are making suggestions as well. And there was a suggestion to affect adventure class ships as well. And my kind of ruling on that was, nope, we're not going to do that. Uh, I don't want everyone to have to redesign their free traders and lab ships and safari ships, etc. Right. Would you say however, that? Oh, go on. Oh, oh, go ahead. No, no, go. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, however, <laughs> uh, weapons are different now. There are some things that we noticed about weaponry that we wanted to change. And uh, while your turret weapons are largely the same in, in what they can do, we introduced the concept of damage multiples. And this was the idea of, uh, of Jeremy Rector, one of the guys I worked on this thing. And at first he suggested it and I was like, no, 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 sounds too hard. And then he, he spreadsheeted it for me. And I took a look and I thought, okay, uh, this, this can work. This is good. It provides a more even scale from tur or from fixed you know fixed mount weapon to turret to barbette to bay weapons to spinal mounts. And there's now a, a, a more appropriate linear progression of damage um, and destruction that they can wreak. And um, and your barbettes are now going to be more deadly. And I know that there are adventure class ships with barbettes on them, but they they will do more damage. But one thing we noticed in a lot of the designs, the extant designs. Are, is that no one puts large bays and, and there are very few medium bays. So why have them? 
if they're if you know if they're if you're not going to put them in your capital ships. So the damage multiples rules makes them valuable because now you you've got these multiple levels. Of, if you want to imagine big fleet encounters, you've got your destroyers, right? Your destroyer escorts. Then you get to cruisers, battle or carriers, battleships, and dreadnoughts. Now large bay is a useful weapon. It can dispatch a destroyer in a couple of shots. Uh, you know, um, the spinal mounts are pretty much typically reserved to take on other capital ships. And with, with the armor increased like it is, you're, you're definitely, you, you're going to have to make choices as to what kind of weapons you need to face down the opponent that you expect to face. I think people are going to have a lot of fun with it, but it, but it is quite different. Uh, it's, it's got, it's the same basic rules, but adding multiples in increases, you, you'll see that at each level it, it adds damage to, uh, so that it, it's a more linear progression up to spinal mount. Spinal mounts are ridiculously powerful, but one of the questions, one of my, uh, it was once again, Jeremy uh, involved in the project, he said, all you have to think of, Chris, is what's the story you want to tell? And I wanted, I, I took a look at the story that I think they were trying to tell with the original High Guard and started to think, what do we want it to be? Uh, because the story is, do we want missiles to be able to completely wreck a ship? Because they're to really defend yourself against missiles, you have to have tons of countermeasures. Um, and if you don't have them, you're going to get blown up. It, likewise, the, the, um, I think the story of Traveler is that spinal mounts are death rays. <laughs> and we, we, don't, we don't shy away from that in this, in this rejiggering of the rules. Awesome. So, uh, it, yeah, there's lots of other aspects of it as well but, um, uh, it, that, uh, that, that go into it. But... Um, what we're trying to do is tell the story that Traveler was meant to tell, and now expanding it so that when you when you have a capital ship battle or a fleet battle, it it tells this it, it tells the story of of what we expect it to be, which is it's probably a very fast and destructive encounter, and it, the the side with more weapons and higher technology is likely to devastate the other one. There's going to be some leeway for a good for good tacticians and uh, and higher qualified crews, but ultimately the guys with the bigger guns are going to do better. And when you in, in, end up in a battle like that, you're probably going to have to decide, uh, is it worth it? <laughs> right. <laughs> my, I've found that my uh, players are risk averse when it comes to their ship. I'm sorry, what was that? My players are risk averse when it comes to their ship. They do not want to get in a fight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and rightfully so. They, they can get wrecked. Uh, right. Fairly easily, yeah. And there's there's some other great additions to uh, the the new high guard as well. The crew roll section is super detailed on every single role that you serve on a ship. There's a new sensors chapter that tries to clear some of uh, clears up some of the ambiguity with sensors. And all of the ships in the uh, final, or actually before that, boarding actions. Forgot about that. Uh, if you if you supported the mercenary. Uh, Kickstarter and and have the mercenary books. There's a section on boarding actions. Uh, Martin wrote it. It's quite it's quite good. And uh, but Matt asked me to write it for High Guard as well. So I tried to follow Martin's approach, but make it more general. And I I like how it came out. It a lot of there's a lot of aspects to shooting guns and having battles on a ship that have never been discussed. And I think we we kind of covered that. Oh yeah, and finally we redid most of the ships. Uh, the, the the ships in the uh, uh, spacecraft of the third Imperium section were modified. We added several new ones. There's a battle rider in there. There's a torpedo bomber, the Tigris and the, the Plankwell. All these ships got redesigned with the new rules. Um, you, they do have more armor. It's, however, trying to pay obeisance to the classic designs of those ships did limit it somewhat. You want it to, I want it to look, still look, be recognizable as the Tigris from classic traveler. Um, so, uh, to some extent, you won't see us go all out. However, what I expect people to do is go, hey, I'm going to design better capital ships with these rules. And and I, I'm looking forward to seeing where people go with it. Fantastic. That'll be awesome. A whole, whole new uh, player made armadas. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, 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 uh, we're, the last section that we're dealing with right now that hasn't been developed is fleet combat. Working on that right now. Um, trying to create it in a way that uh, one one thing one has to remember of Traveler is it's it's a role playing game. It's not a war game, and you don't want a whole. If you can avoid it, you don't want a whole session to go to uh, space combat or fleet combat. 
Um, have you run with space combat in your uh, campaigns? Frank? Uh, nope. Yeah, generally speaking, uh, it like they take it's just been cinematic. Okay, that's a great way to approach it. And but you can look at the rules if you want and kind of get a sense of how it's going to uh, end up. We run it several times, and I try to make it run quickly because, frankly, people get left out. Um, it's uh, it, there's unless your ship is getting hit, your engineer is going to have nothing to do. Right. Uh, I, the, the, we try to keep the, everybody involved with, with like rolling modifiers yeah. being passed around to whoever needs to take action next. Right. Yeah. So a cinematic approach is best, which is what they went for in the core rulebook rules. And we want to do something like that for fleet combat. Now, who's going to use fleet combat? I, I probably someone who's running a naval campaign. And of course, as you know, there is a naval campaign source book that's in the uh, uh, element class cruisers set. Um, so the idea will be that everyone has something to do in a fleet combat encounter. Uh, you, you, will, you will have rules to enable to you resolve one quickly, because as you can imagine, if you have upwards of 20 or 30, 100 ships, it's, <laughs> that can take you days to resolve unless you have an appropriate uh, system to, to, uh, uh, to, to sort of explain how it goes to, to resolve the encounter. All right. Well, we got a couple minutes left. You want to give us okay. a preview of anything that's coming out in the next year? Yeah. Well. Okay. Uh, we I mentioned the uh, the graphic novel. Really excited about that. Working with Javier on that. Um, the it's the first. It's it, what it is. It's going to be. We've committed to multiple uh, graphic novels. They're each also first introduced as four issue uh, series, like comic book and. Um, so each one, each issue is 24 pages. So it's a 96, they're contributing to a 96 page graphic novel. So you could, you can buy the individual issues, which you're going to want to, because they're going to have Javier's awesome cover art on them. And then, or you can wait for the graphic novel, which will uh, compile all four. Um, the, another cool aspect of the, these, and the story, the first one is called the Traveler Far Trader, and it deals with the crew of a far trader that's in the Spinward Marches and is taking on a risky uh, freight delivery, freight and passenger delivery job. And I don't want to spoil too much other than that, but of course they run into trouble and they run into the kind of situations that uh, player characters, that travelers run into all the time, right? These decisions. You want to keep your ship flying. Um, am, am I willing to do this kind of dirty job so that I can pay my mortgage and keep right. things going? Right. Right. And Right. And it's funny because as, I'm, as I was writing it, I was thinking, God, you know, play, one of the interesting dynamics of role playing is uh, that you don't see in like a movie is typically the characters will do dirty, underhanded stuff because they don't it's not the same kind of narrative. Right? right. When you watch Star Wars, Han Solo, of course, he came back to help Luke. He can't just leave. Um, in Traveler, you might go, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to let my Y-1300 ship get damaged in that stupid fight with the Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out and how the characters in the story play. And, and um, the uh, first three graphic novels, so we're talking the first 12 issues, will deal with more or less the same characters as they, as they develop and, and adventure in the Spinward Marches. And another cool thing about them is every issue will have uh, actual gaming material for players of the game to use. So there will be ship designs and weapons and, and technology, uh, lore write-ups. Things that um, someone could use if they if they like the setting of the story and want to adventure there themselves. Awesome. We'll be looking yeah. out for that. So, uh, how do people find your products? Okay, so uh, you can find uh, the uh, most of my mongoose products are available at their website, mongoosepublishing.com, and also available at drivethroughrpg.com. The uh, the graphic novel, once it starts to become available, is from Marcosia Comics. That's M A R K O S I A, and I urge you to check out their website. It's a British comic book company, and they've got a lot of cool titles. And we're very proud and uh, honored that they are willing to to publish the very first Traveler comics to ever be made. So um, it'd be awesome. That will yeah, and they, oh, in addition, I, I mentioned that they come out as individual issues. A big comic, a big way of distributing comics these days is uh, uh, like with a reader. So you never have paper versions of it. You just get it graphically and watch it in a comic reader. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. 
Well, we've come to the end of our interview. Great. All right. Well, thanks for sitting awesome. for us. Uh, I'm your host, Frank Sicardi, also known as Cyborg Prime. And today I've been talking with my friend, Christopher Griffin of Mongoose Publishing. Thanks very much, Frank. I had a lot of fun and look forward to, uh, to talking with you again next year. Thanks so much, Chris, for participating in our fourth annual May Day May Day event. And I do hope you'll return next year. And thank no you. Doubt about it. Thank you, dear listener, for joining us for this fourth annual May Day May Day event. That's all for now, travelers. Until next time, happy traveling. This data crystal will self-destruct in five seconds.